Hello, Every Nation family. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a blessing. And here to help us get through the week is Pastor Henry. Buckle up, listen up, and take Good day, note. family, and welcome to our online sermon series called Keys. And I want to start off by thanking you for tuning into this sermon series. We have heard so many testimonies of how God has been stirring up people's faith. So this sermon series is all about faith. We believe that God has given us keys to unlock the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And one of those keys that he has given us is faith. And I want to start off by saying that your faith is important. What you believe is really important because what you believe will determine where you're going to end up in this life. And most importantly, it's going to determine where you're going to spend eternity. Our faith is important. In this sermon series, we've been looking at faith. So faith is the substance, the evidence of things not yet seen. Faith is that resilience to believe that God exists. Even though I cannot see him, I know for a fact that he is real and that he is working in and through my life. We know that faith is important. And one of the things we've been speaking about is how do I get faith. If faith is so important, how do I get faith? And Romans 10 verse 17 gives us the perfect answer. It says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. I want to say that what you believe or what you are listening to will determine what you believe. We are a product of what we are listening to right now. If you are listening to nonsense, if you are listening to lies, you will believe lies and you will act on lies. Faith comes by hearing and, the, and God says that we must listen to the word of God. Faith comes by hearing. And then Romans 10, 10 says that faith leads us to a place of righteousness. It says for with the heart a person believes resulting in righteousness. So faith leads me into righteousness. Righteousness is a place of right standing before God. It's justification. Just if I never sinned, you know, I'm justified. So faith comes by hearing. That hearing leads me to a place of righteousness before God. And that place of righteousness before God is a place of authority, right? When we understand faith and we have righteousness before God, I have authority in the kingdom of God. That is what God has given me. The word says that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places because of our faith. All right. So when, once I have that authority and that position before God, I can start speaking and declaring what God wants to do in this earth. I want to tell you that you are God's plan for this world. Jesus has already done his part. And now he said, I've given you authority. Go and make disciples, rule and reign, bring my kingdom to your world. And that is our responsibility. And we do that by speaking, by using our words. My question is, what are you speaking and declaring over your life? Family, listen to me. The words that we speak have power. It says in Proverbs that life and death is, lies in the tongue. Our tongue has power over life and death, good and bad. My question is, how are you using your words today? Listen to Mark 11 verse 22. Jesus is speaking and he says this, Have faith in God. Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go and throw yourself in the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. I love this so much. Jesus is speaking to the disciples. Now, these guys, they had to walk wherever they wanted to go. So a mountain was a true obstacle. It was a true barrier. They didn't like mountains because when there's a mountain, it meant that they had to walk up that mountain. Nowadays, we love mountains because we can just drive and we love looking at the view. But these guys had to walk. So Jesus, when he speaks about the mountain, he's speaking about a true obstacle in their lives. And Jesus says, if you say to that mountain, and go and throw yourself in the sea or move, that mountain will move. And remember, Jesus says, anyone that says to that mountain, says means that you need to use your voice. It means that something needs to come out of your mouth. It's a physical action. And I, and I love this because it's important to understand that we need to make our faith practical. And one way that we bring what's inside of our hearts into our world is by speaking it. When I start declaring what's in my heart and I start speaking it, it becomes a reality. My question is, 
are you speaking to your mountains? Because family, if we're not going to learn to speak to our mountains, we will struggle up our mountains for the rest of our lives. You will need to struggle over your mountains until you are going to learn to speak to your mountains because that is what Jesus commanded us to do. So speak to those mountains, speak to that marriage problem, speak to that financial problem, speak to that addiction, speak to the mountains in your life. I would encourage you to speak to your mountains. We said earlier in the sermon series, we said that everything has ears. You need to speak to those mountains because those mountains in your life does have ears. Everything that was created was created by a word. So the sun has ears because when God said, let there be light, the sun heard and responded. Everything that was created responded to a word. So everything has ears. And that is why we need to speak to those mountains in our lives. Proverbs 18, 21, like I mentioned, says the tongue has power of life and death and those who love it will eat its fruit. Family, I want to encourage you. Understand the authority. Understand that faith comes by hearing. And when I have faith, I have righteousness. When I have righteousness, I have a place of authority in the kingdom of God. And from that place of authority, I can say to mountains, move. And the word of God says, if I do not doubt, they will move. I want to tell you that the mountains in your life can move if you speak to them in faith. Stop trying to fix things out of your own own strength and start speaking what Jesus commanded us to speak. And I want to illustrate this, the power of our words, by telling you three short stories. The first story we're going to look at is the story of Zechariah. Now, Zechariah was a priest who was righteous before God, and him and his wife, Elizabeth, were childless because Elizabeth was barren, uh, and, and they were both well advanced in years. And then one day an angel comes to Zechariah and the angel in Luke 1 verse 13 says this, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will have a child. It will be a boy and you must call him John. I love this. What an amazing story. An angel comes to, uh, to, to, to Zechariah and says, your prayers have been heard. You see that he's been standing in faith and he's been praying over this. And then finally the breakthrough comes. The promise is here. The breakthrough is here. You're going to have a child and you must call him John, which will then be John the Baptist, the one who is supposed to come and prepare the way for the Messiah. So John the Baptist was, 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 was prophesied in the Old Testament. John was part of God's big plan to prepare the way for the Messiah. And now the angel comes to Zechariah and says, you will be the parents of this promised child that will prepare the way for the Messiah. And then in verse 18, the next thing happens. Zechariah asked the angel, how can it, can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is old too. So we see that that Zechariah responds with disbelief. The words that comes out of his mouth are not words of faith. It's words of doubt. He's saying to this angel, but how can it be? He's thinking twice about this. He's overthinking it. He's not taking the promise and running with it. He's doubting the promise. And then look at what happens in verse 20. And now you will have to be silent. So the angel speaks to him and says, you will have to be silent. You will not be able to speak until after John is born. That's because you did not believe my words. We see this story. We see that Zechariah responds with disbelief. He starts speaking death over what God wants to do. And the angel said, because you did not believe, because you responded in disbelief, and because you spoke in disbelief, you will have to remain quiet. You will have to remain silent. It is as if the Lord is saying, I know that you have the authority to speak death over what needs to happen, but John needs to prepare the way for Jesus. And because John must come, I will make you silent because if you're going to continue speaking, you will speak death over the plans that I have. Family, I understand that this sounds sounds massive, but do you understand that you can speak death over what God wants to do in your life? Do you understand that your words has got so much authority that you can, can speak death over the breakthrough that God wants to bring into your life? My question is, what are you speaking and declaring over your own life? And and with respect, sometimes I, 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 I want to ask God, God, rather make me silent before I speak death. Family, if you cannot say something positive about your life, about your marriage, about your circumstances, about your finances, about your health, rather keep quiet. Zip it. And it's almost as if the angels said to, 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 um, to Zachariah, 
It's as if the angel said to Zechariah, zip it. You're not going to be able to speak because if you're going to continue to speak, you're going to speak death. And then we see that John the Baptist was born. He did prepare the way for Jesus. He baptized Jesus. He played the role that God wanted him to play. Such a powerful story that shows us the power of our words. The second story that I want to share with you quickly is the story of the Israelites' unbelief in the desert. So we see that the Israelites are delivered from Egypt. They pass through the Red Sea. They see miracle upon miracle. They see the plagues, a, a, a massive, massive breakthrough. They see the mighty hand of God move. And then within a couple of months after le leaving Egypt, they actually reach the shores of the promised land. All right. So they arrive at the destination. They see the promised land and God tells them to send 12 spies into the promised land. And then those 12 spies were sent out and they came back with a report. And we're going to read this report in Numbers 13 from verse 27. It says, they gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is the fruit. But the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. Now the descendants of Anak were, were giants. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites and the Amorites live in the hill country and the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. So these 12 spies come back and they've got a great report. They start off by saying it is indeed the land of milk and honey and they show some of the fruits that's, that's growing in the land and they're excited. But then fear and doubt sets in and they start saying but, but the people there are massive. And, and there's a lot of different people living in the nation. And we saw giants and they've got this, this, this almost this fear that's starting to rise up. And then in, in verse 30, Caleb steps up and then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. And I love this. So out of the 12 spies, 10 of them say, listen, it's impossible. There's giants and we are so small and we can't do it. And then Caleb stands up and he says, we've got to do this. We can do this. God is on our side. God is going to deliver us. They remember what God actually already did for them. And they say, let's do this. But unfortunately, the story doesn't end there. It continues in verse 31 and listen what happens. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. And all the people we saw were of great size. We see that their negativity and the lies that they believed and their fear made them spread a bad report. And I want to tell you, isn't that how the enemy still works today? The enemy loves a good rumor. All right. And they started spreading a rumor around the people that the land is bad and it devours its people, which was not true. They came back initially and said it's the land of milk and honey. But because of their fear, because they believed the wrong things, because they started speaking to each other and, and igniting fear in each other's hearts, they started spreading a bad report. Family, and this is again such a great example of how our words have power. Had they listened to Caleb's words, had they listened to faith, their whole life would have been different. Let's see how this ended out for the, for, for the Israelites. In Numbers 14 verse 34, this is what God says. For 40 years, one for each of the days that you explored the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to have me against you. So we see that the Israelites, because of their unbelief, because they did not believe that God was with them, because they did not believe that God would help them, because they, they, ha they didn't have faith, God said, now, because of this, you will wander in the desert for 40 years. Do you see that God's original plan was to set them free from Egypt, and within a couple of months, they would be in the promised land? But because they didn't have faith, because they believed the wrong story, they read the wrong newspaper, they forgot God's promises. They had to wander in the desert for 40 years. Do you see the power of the wrong belief? Do you see the power of speaking the wrong things over your situation? And you know what's so crazy about this whole story? God actually told them beforehand what his plans 
were when they got to the promised land. Listen to this in Exodus 28 verse 23. You remember that the Israelites spoke about the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Canaanites and all those people that they were so afraid of. God actually had a plan for all of those guys. Listen to this. Exodus 28 23 says, I will send the hornets ahead of you to drive the Hivites, the Canaanites, the Hittites out of your way. So God already made a promise that when you get to the promised land, don't stress about what you see because I will send hornets ahead of you to drive them out. That is what God had promised them, but they forgot it. They started believing the wrong things. So God's plan was the moment you guys step into the promised land, you will hear hornets come from the back. A hornet is, is like a parabay for the Afrikaans people listening. It is a thing that stings you. That is the thing that God wanted to send ahead of the Israelites can you imagine being a Hittite or a Jebusite or a Canaanite? You see people coming over the river and the next moment there is, there is hornets all over you and you start running for your life. All right. God was going to fight the battle for them, but they forgot. They forgot that their God was with them. And because they forgot that, instead of stepping into the promised land and taking possession of everything, they had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. My question is, are you walking in the wilderness because of unbelief? Ask yourself today, in what area are you walking in the wilderness because of unbelief? Because you've forgotten to stand on the promises of God. Because you've started to believe the wrong report. You see, there's always going to be two reports. There's going to be the Caleb report that says, God can do it, let's do it. And then there's going to be the voice of the enemy that says, you can't do it. If you are going to believe the wrong report, you're going to be walking in the wilderness of your life. But if you're going to stand up and believe what God has said, you will walk into your promised land. That is what God shows us in this picture. Trust in me and I will make Make a way. Family, stand on the word of God. His word cannot return void. If he has said it, he'll do it. He's not a man that he can lie. He's for you, not against you. Come on, stand in faith on what God wants to do in your life. We see that the Israelites missed it for 40 years. Instead of eating the grapes, pruning the vineyards, having a great life in abundance, they had to walk in the desert because they believed the wrong report. Because they didn't hold on to the word of God. Come on, hold on to the word of God in your own life. Get out of the desert and start walking into your promised land. The third and the final story that I want to share with you just illustrates once again the power of our words. So we see that Moses uh, led the Israelites out of Egypt. They came to the shores of the promised land. They believed the wrong report, like I just said. And then they found themselves in the wilderness. They are walking around in the desert in circles for 40 years. And, and if you know what happens when you walk in the desert? You get thirsty. And they came to a place called Meribah and, and they were thirsty. And, and that's where we pick up this story. It's in Numbers 20 from verse 7. It says, The Lord said to Moses, Take your staff, and, uh, and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Listen, speak to that rock before their eyes and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so that they and their livestock can drink. So we see them wandering in the desert. They get thirsty. They come to this place and God says, speak to the rock. You see that God says, speak to the rock. Does the rock have ears? Yes, of course a rock has ears. Why would God tell Moses to speak to a rock if a rock doesn't have ears? I want to remind you that everything in your life has ears. Even if you look at it and think, but this rock doesn't have ears. This, is, this shows us prophetically that every single thing in your life has ears. So God says, speak to the rock. But listen, let's see what Moses does in verse 11. Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as the Holy One inside of the Israelites, you will not bring the community into the land, or into the promised land. Oh, family, this is such an, such an amazing story. It's actually such a sad story because God tells Moses to speak to the rock. Moses, out of his own strength and his frustration in that moment, instead of speaking to the rock, he struck the rock. And because he struck the rock, God says, you cannot enter the promised land. You will not lead the people into the promised land. This is, this is, this is such, a, such a, a deep reminder for each and every one of us that when God says speak, we must speak. Moses tried to fix the problem out of his own strength. 
when we speak and we stand in that place of authority, we do not speak in our, on our own authority. We speak on the authority of God. And when God says speak, we must speak. Too many times we try to hit things when we should speak to them. Many of us today are tired of hitting our situations. We are tired of striving and trying to fix things in our own strength. When God has said, stand on my strength and just declare what I've already done. God said, speak. I want to tell you that a man with authority doesn't have to hit. He can just speak. Moses in that moment forgot where his strength came from. And instead of, of speaking from the authority of God, he struck out of his own power. Stop trying to fix things with your own strength and stand on the finished work of the cross and declare what God has already done for you. When I look at this story, I, when I read it the first time, even when I was younger, I always thought that this is very harsh. Moses laid down everything to follow God. He, he, he did everything in obedience to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. He was a great leader. And yet this one small thing he did struck striking the rock instead of speaking to the rock and that disqualified him from seeing the promised land i always thought that this is very harsh um i mean moses did a couple of worse things in my mind than this moses was a murderer you remember he killed an egyptian if there was something that would disqualify him from the promised land maybe it would be murder and yet it wasn't murder that disqualified him from the promised land. It was this fact, the fact that he struck instead of speaking. And it's almost as if God is showing us in this moment how important this is to him. He wants us to stand on the finished work of the cross. He wants us to declare what he has done and not do things out of our own strength. But what I love about the story of Moses is that even though Moses missed the promised land in his physical life, he didn't miss out on the promised land. In Matthew 17, we see that Moses was in the promised land. We see it in the transfiguration of Jesus. Matthew 17 verse 2 says, There he was transfigured before them, that is Jesus. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And I love this so much. You know what? God is faithful. And his, his mercy is enough. His grace is enough. Moses missed the promised land in his physical life. But he gained something so much better. He was in the promised land with the promised land. Jesus. Today, Jesus is our promised land. He is the one that it's all about. And Moses was in Jerusalem, in the promised land, with Jesus. Moses never missed out. And I, and I want to encourage you today. Maybe you've, you've messed up. Maybe your whole life you've been missing this and speaking the wrong things. I want to remind you of this story that God's grace is enough. And His grace was enough for Moses and His grace is enough for us. And God will not allow us to miss out if we put Him first. I think the story of Moses' life is he was humble and he put God first. And even though he made mistakes, because he put God first, God gave him the desires of his heart. He saw the promised land. He saw it even better than he would have seen it if he had seen it with his physical eyes while he was alive. Family, I want to remind you that maybe you've messed up. Maybe you've missed the mark many times. But God's grace is enough. If we come to him and we say, God, help us. Help us to, to align our words with what you want us to speak. Help us to, to speak life over the situations. Even though I've messed up, his grace is enough. And he can save you and he can turn any situation around. I want to end off by praying for you today. Father God, thank you that you are faithful. Thank you, Lord, that your word cannot return void. And thank you for the authority you've given us, not that we deserve it, but because of what you've done on the cross, Jesus. And thank you, Lord, that we can start speaking and declaring life over our situations. Thank you for the authority, for the righteousness that we have through faith. Help us to stay in your word so that our faith can increase and help us to speak life over our seasons and our situations. In Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, what a word. Thank you so much, Pastor Henry. It ministered to me and family. I know that it ministered to you. Now, if you want to get in touch with us, you are welcome to follow any of the details here on the screen or get in the comment section. We'd love to get to know you, get to hear from you. We'd love to pray with you. Now, until then, goodbye and God bless you.